um, from from the first meeting of those folks uh, while Farm Alliance began. And we, as you can see, are promoting a healthy, vibrant agriculture that protects and restores wild nature. Um, I am, um, let's see, I used to be an organic farmer for a dozen years. Um, I have a, a master's looking at birds eating codling moth in apple orchards. Um, and um, let's see, other stuff about me. Um, I've written a lot of publications about this intersection of conservation and agriculture. And I'm gonna talk about some of those um, now. So uh, just get keep going, looking at these slides. This first slide is um, coyote brush. I, um, shoot, I forget the bird though. I think it's a... Uh, bush tail, uh, isn't it? Yeah, I I bet you're right. It looks like a bush tit. Um, yeah, so it was fun to see that you all have a program on birds and plants. Um, there we go. So tonight I'm going to talk about Wild Farm Alliance's 2050 vision, what we do, some past milestones we've had, uh, and then I'm going to dig into some of our work and share about how habitat supports beneficial insects and that birds provide pest control services and how to support them with boxes and habitat. So we have this 2050 vision that's really bold. We want to see a million nest boxes and perches on farms. We want to see hedgerows to the moon and back and uh, we want to see um, riparian areas be restored. So if you want to learn a lot more about that, our 2050 vision is on our website, wildfarmalliance.org. And we're not going to read through all of this, but um, we are, uh, the, the, I think the most important uh, pieces of this is um, what, what it means for a million nest boxes and perches, it would be on 10% of the farms and they would have an average of five nest boxes and, uh, and or perches. For hedgerows to the moon and back, that is a concept is coming from the UK because um, the United Kingdom used to have 500,000 miles and that's the same length. They now have about half of that because industrial ag has taken over a lot of those hedgerows, although now they're, um, I think for the most part protected, what's left. And the, and then um, we wanna see 10% of the river frontage on farms restored. We have this approach of um, visualizing solutions with, um, with land stewards that are doing a great job and then sharing that knowledge modeling those practices and then uh sharing it even wider to get uh um you know full scale adoption this is uh, some of the things that we have uh reported on in our annual report um we've put up 250 nest boxes along the central coast um, about 8,000 people are in our network. We help 35 growers um, apply for funding to put in uh, conservation practices like hedgerows. Uh, just last year, we published 11 resources, which was um, which was a lot, but they're all about uh, helping growers bring nature back to the farm. Um, we have a lot of views. I think it's actually now up to 50 views of our little short videos that we create. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, we do field days. So 800 people came uh, last year and um, we help farmers install 
hedgerows and other kinds of habitat. So here are some of the field days. Juan Santana is up at the top and he we're looking at this native plant hedgerow and um, they were all labeled at the time and a lot of people were interested in in planting them. This is at an a, a conventionally managed almond orchard in the Central Valley. They um they were using IPM practices. Um, this is another field day in uh up in Sacramento area where another uh, conservation planning was along a drainage ditch and. Um, the grower loved this, uh, Dwayne um, Chamberlain loves, um, uh, uh, um, he loves birds. And he had this cool story about when he floods his alfalfa fields, there's a, um, a wave of water, well, uh, the water um, advances across the field and it brings up all these rodents that are right on the edge of the water and then a whole bunch of egrets and great blue herons show up to feast on them, which is, um, yeah, I, I have seen that a little bit. It's quite a show. Um, I did a field day in uh, Napa with Julie Johnson at um, her face of Boris Vineyard and um, the vineyards are a lot of vineyards, um, have more money than any other um any other crop you can grow you can do a lot of money uh growing wine and or these uh, a lot of the people who own vineyards are, are already have a lot of money and i bring that up because they not that julie necessarily does but a lot of the people who are attending attended this event were um really, really interested in uh, doing all they could to be sustainable. And and I think that having funds, enough funds to do the right thing is part of the the whole story that we are, um, yeah, that, that of agriculture. There's a lot of crops that it's hard to make a, a good living at. And Oh, looks like uh, Joanne's signal is frozen here. Let's hope she comes back in a moment. I see you're connecting back in now. Do we have you back, Joanne? You're muted. Okay, um, can you uh, unmute? We're seeing your screen now, but we're not hearing you. Uh, okay, now I unmuted. I don't know what happened. Um, yeah, it was probably... Uh, here we go. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I think uh, an alien spaceship probably got in between. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, anyway, so we make these presentations at uh, Ag Commissioner meetings and 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 I was uh, not so sure growers were gonna be um, interested in the talk we gave here was all about birds and how they help with pest control. And, they, and then the growers were really interested. So that was good um 
We offer continuing education units to growers too, because they, for the same reason that they go to those meetings, they need to get, if they're going to use pesticides, they need to get um, education units. And um, so just yesterday, got an email from one of the um, people who attended saying, your course was unlike most continuing education courses where I'm usually shocked by the accepted ag practices promoted in these courses. Your course was a pleasant surprise. Anyways, um, things are changing and that's a good thing. Uh, we also offer webinars and, and we have a virtual course uh, where we worked with 16 researchers presenting on birds and their pest control services. And also there's a few species of birds that are pests and how do you manage them as part of that course. We create videos, as I mentioned, we, um, they're just five minute videos. This was with Rachel Long. She's a researcher who's looked at um, beneficial insects and hedgerows. And um, she, we paired her her uh, interview with Juan Santana's and um, yeah, just five minutes long, but has a bunch of nuggets of uh, Rachel's research and then um, Juan talking about why he's doing what he's doing. Um, and we that's where we're getting, there's about 5,000 views of, no, 50,000, 50,000 views now of our videos, maybe, I think we have 15 videos. So we create all kinds of publications um, to help growers under, better understand nature and how they can uh, benefit from it and support it. Uh, this is one of the growers we work with. He says, farming with nature is the solution rather than against it, Medlock or um, Ames Morrison at Medlock Ames Winery. We also help growers put in plantings, as I mentioned. So this is a, a big hedgerow going in on a farm in Hollister, and they're putting in compost in the holes. Um, it's a native plant hedgerow. It's the only fertilizer we use. Um, and we tell growers never, they, they often will fertilize uh, put chemical fertilizers in their, or, or organically approved fertilizers in their irrigation water. And we tell them not to do that because what happens with, what we've seen is the native plants grow really fast and then they lodge, they fall over because um, it's just too much. A couple of the things we've done is, um, uh, maybe this is about six years ago, well, actually, no, many years ago, we started helping the organic industry um, achieve these rules that have been in place since since the USDA organic program began, which is growers are supposed to conserve biodiversity and maintain or improve their soil, water, wetlands, woodlands, and wildlife. And when we started, growers didn't know what the word biodiversity means. And while uh, there are some growers that are doing this and a lot that still aren't they they are um i think all of them know what that means now and i think uh many more are realizing if you're organic grower you need you need to work with nature these are some of the organic publications that we have um created we also are working with the organic program on this uh one of the on a proposed rule, they have a, a board that guides what they do. And we we worked for years uh, educating the organic community and the board um, about how it's really not a good thing for it. Once you're certified, you can, you're supposed to conserve biodiversity, but before you're certified organic, you can cut down like this rainforest and then get certified right away. And it's not right. And so the the NOSB, the National Organic Standards Board, uh, pro has this proposed rule that they've told the USDA sh they should implement to protect native ecosystems from the organic plow. And they that was in 2018. And we thought that was a success, but 
but the USDA is still not implemented. So, um, yeah, it's an ongoing issue for us. We had success with um, food safety issues. Uh, the FDA, I don't know, um, let me see, y'all probably remember the spinach contamination in, in 2006, five people, three or five people died. Um, and um, it pretty much, uh, uh, a lot of big buyers started telling farmers, we don't want anything on the farm but the crop. and. Um, to the detriment of, you know, a lot of habitat and a lot of species that use that habitat. So we worked hard on policy with a bunch of people nationally, and um, we got the FDA to say in rules that they do not require habitat destruction or killing of wildlife. And we felt like that was a huge win. So now I'm going to talk about um, habitat and how it supports beneficial insects. We have a couple of different um, projects funded by the Department of Pesticide Regulation. So on, it's, it's interesting, on one hand, they allow all these pesticides, but on another hand, they really are trying to get growers to go in this more sustainable pest management uh, angle. And so are funding us. And and um, so um, Rachel Long, who you saw me interviewing on that earlier slide, she did a study, you know, a long time ago in 98, showing how beneficial insects move about 250 feet um, away from this hedgerow, this flowering hedgerow out into the crop. Um, that was in field crops. And then in orchards, they don't move out as far, but they're moving up too. So, um, and I bet you they move for further, uh, or it depends, but um, yeah. So who are we talking about? There's parasitoid wasps that um, lay their eggs in caterpillars. There's also parasitoid flies that will lay their eggs in not just caterpillars, but other kinds of pests or other, not that all caterpillars are pests, but other kind of but in this case, we are hoping they're laying their eggs in pests. Um, could be in eggs, not just the caterpillar. Um, and here's a picture of lady big bird, ladybugs on deer grass, um, an assassin beetle on buckwheat. Um, there's study that shows uh, one of Rachel's studies show that. Uh, hedgerow plants don't bring in more pest insects, but she compared that to weedy borders and the weedy borders really do. And it has to do with these annual weeds produce a lot of seeds that pest insects really like. Here's a picture of a surfed fly on buckwheat. One of the interesting um, and kind of cool um, practices that happens a lot in this area and a lot probably all organic and I by this area I mean in Watsonville and in the Salinas Valley um, they plant alyssum these alyssum strips every so often or they'll they'll actually plug uh, plant little uh, you know alyssum plants every so often instead of a lettuce or other kinds of cool season crops because they um, these uh, this alyssum attracts surfed flies, and it has to do with the flower is really really short, and these insects are short and or small. They have small mouth parts, and <laughs> I guess all, all insects are short. But in any case, um, they they you know this this plant really supports them, and. Um, there's a big grower we're working with that says that he's they've got um, comments back from their buyer saying, uh, you know, they have too many bugs in their pack, but it turns out they're beneficial insects. There's too many <laughs> beneficial insects. So, um, but <clears throat> we are working to identify research projects that have um, found native plants that are beneficial to um, uh, that support um, 
beneficial predator, pre predaceous insects, and also parasites. Predaceous insects are um, ber uh, insects like lady beetles that will eat, eat anything as opposed to lay their eggs in, in, in a pest. And this is just a flowering chart that shows that we really want in those hedgerows and other conservation plantings, we try and plant a variety of plants that, um, so there'll be some flowering at any one time. This is showing some data from, um, from a hedgerow and how uh, there's different uh, abundances of wasp parasitoids on different uh, plant species, native plants, and also green lace wings. Um, so, so it's interesting how some peak at different times. And But you can see how having a mix is a good thing. Here's a native plant. Uh, Hedrocyanothus. Um, and um, Rachel, along, along with uh, Laura Morandon, did a study where they looked at how long it would take to break even from uh, insecticide savings if they were to, if you were to plant a 4,000 foot hedgerow and it on average costs about $4 a foot. So it would take you 16 years or take a grower 16 years. But that was just looking at the pest or pest management benefits. If they also looked at the pollination benefits and the return time reduced to seven years. But um, and so that another way to look at it is about six hundred dollars of value to the grower each year. However, right now, California, the state of California is offering funding to help growers put in this habitat for free. So they can, they don't have to wait seven years in order to pay back. They can get instant, uh, instant benefit. Um, so I've been talking about insects, but there's birds that are attracted to these hedgerows and they help with pest control. Um, uh, here's another quote from a, a local grower. When you're farming with birds and mother nature uh, are present, it's a lot easier because you're getting help to deal with some of the pests that you otherwise have to rely on chemicals to eliminate. That's Javier Zamora. Hedros are also good at helping um, water better infiltrate. And uh, if they're up against the ditch like this one, they can help trap pollutants. Um, so there's a lots of benefits to hedros. Another benefit is that they store lots of carbon. Um, I, yeah, and you can see at the different levels of this schematic that uh, different amounts of carbon are being stored. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I have to read this one. I, for, I forgot about this one. A hedro meta study estimated 104. Um, mm, let's skip this one. There's a lot of carbon stored. I know about this slide. Um, this is a cool study where uh, they found that 18% of the carbon was stored on 6% of the land. And where it was stored, most of it was stored in the riparian corridor where, you know, there's lots of woody trees and in the hedgerow. Um, this, these other fields, uh, there was something else going on there. I think it was cover crops and compost. This is a before picture of a repairing area and an after picture. This is from NRCS. And we would love to see a lot more of that kind of um, habitat go in because repairing areas are super important to the 75% um, of, of wildlife in the Western US. They use it, it's 75% uses it, it during part of their life cycle. 
we just published this document on the left and it tells growers how to that the steps and timeline of putting in a conservation planning like from talking to the nursery and how you um, transport all these plants back to your farm and how you know how do you set up irrigation system and everything and and this document on the right is actually written by my husband um and um yeah it's a really useful document too that just talks about um, planting natives on farms so let me see right now i have um looks like i i should wrap it up in about 10 minutes maybe or less and we could see if there's any questions um I was going to switch over and talk about supporting beneficial birds and managing pest birds, which is this document we published in um, 2019, I think. Most growers and I guess people in general, when they think about birds helping with pest control, they, they think about raptors eating rodents like this barn owl. But the overwhelming majority of songbirds are beneficial during their nesting season because they are feeding so many insects to their nestlings. Um, in this booklet, we in the back of the booklet, we looked at about 120 studies and um, studies looking at were birds helpful with pest control or not. And 90% of them showed that they were helpful. Sometimes it was not, uh, these researchers don't do all the same kind of studies. So some of them were looking at like, were nest boxes helpful? Yes, they were helpful and increased the, the pest control or was putting in habitat helpful? Yes, it was like 25% of the studies show that. So um, there's lots of information. Farmers or researchers have been looking at this issue since, um, well, probably forever farmers have known, but since the 1880s, um, uh, the USDA had a division of economic ornithology and, um, and, and had that, I think, um, 1500 studies were created, were, um, published between like the 1890s and 1930 about avian pest control. And then DDT happened and that all kind of went away, but now there's a resurgence of studying birds and, and, and pest control. And um, that the, the, these uh, crops are just showing all the, or referring to all the different studies that have occurred um, uh, looking at birds uh, offering their pest control services. So we published this document. So uh, nesting structures for beneficial songbirds last year and I mentioned we've been putting up a lot of nest boxes um so uh chickadees are uh, one of the birds that can help with killing collie moth which is the worm in the apple and I took this picture of a parent chickadee parent um with its beak loaded with insects and they and that uh, parent was going in to feed these seven little baby chicks. Um, it, there's been some cool research in Europe uh, looking at a closely related bird, birds, the blue and great tits, uh, and showed that they really help with eating polymoth over there, not just over here, and helped um, increased the apple yield by 66 percent and uh, another study showed the reduction of apple pests by 17 percent you get a closer view of these it's another study showing that there is helping um, pest reductions in grapes peaches and peaches prunes and pears this study uh, looked at how barn swallows help with reducing this oil seep rape, rape pest um, and barn swallows. Um, they like to nest in barns. So we, we um, help farmers think about how they can do that safely. Um, barn swallows also 
are likely to provide um, a lot of pest control in the middle of big strawberry fields. This is a tree swallow and um, one of our farmer friends who you'll see later has uh, um, said that, and this is his farm, uh, Blue Heron Farm, that these tree swallows help reduce flea beetles on his crops in the summer. And he really notices it as soon as they show up on the farm and start nesting. And once they, the um, chicks fledge and the parents leave, um, then the flea beetles come up again or increase. And there's been some really great studies in bluebirds looking at how they are eating vineyard pests like um, uh, like this blue-green sharpshooter that can uh, kill vines. So grow, there's lots of bluebird boxes being put up like in Napa, Sonoma area, and other areas too. Um, let's see. This is good. Oh, maybe it's not. There we go. <laughs> that's fun to watch it it's just delightful to to be around these birds and to know that we are helping them and um and and the grower too so birds live in different parts of a canopy some are in low some are middle some are high uh, they all have similar needs to us and i have a feeling I need to wrap it up. I'm gonna um so they I'm just gonna kind of go through these slides fast. The uh they they um you know the the food that they are collecting uh ha what they collect depends on how far they can go and how much food they need for a little chickadee. Um they're feeding their kids a lot uh, like I don't know, 100, 150 times a day, at least bluebirds do. And um, whereas a barn owl only feeds its chicks six or so times because, uh, and because of that, they can fly much farther. So you don't necessarily have to have a lot of habitat on your farm if you want barn owls but if you want chickadees they're not gonna be there if there's not some habitat around um same with these birds um i think i just went over that birds need cover from uh from the elements and and to from predators um they need water for drinking, for keeping their feathers clean. There's different ways farmers can provide water for growers. I mean, for birds um, in that uh, document, I showed you the cover floor about nesting, nesting structures. This chart is in there. And then when you blow it up, you can see it gives different information on like, what are the birds eating? And where do they uh, prefer the nest boxes to be and how far do the nest boxes be need to be away and what do their eggs look like and what do their nests look like so um yeah all kinds of really useful information if you do have nest boxes or if you're supporting birds with nest shelves um like some birds like robins and barn swallows and phoebes will um nest on shelves or uh, cliff swallows that nest under eaves, but we don't. There are concerns when pu pu putting up boxes. Don't want to use a lot of um, pesticides that are harmful to birds. We, are, we currently have a study, or we're going through the literature looking at uh, which pesticides are the worst for birds, and want to. We'll be publishing that and sharing that with growers. Um, it's I of course having cats around are a problem, um, so you don't want to put a nest box up where cats are nearby. You don't want to put a nest box up where there's a lot of noise because they won't use it. And as 
seems like the climate is getting warmer or not seems like it is getting warmer. Um, sometimes in, in warm areas, if you don't put a nest box with at, where it'll have afternoon shade, you need to put some kind of um, uh, these white cardboard on it to protect, uh, to, to keep the boxes cooler. We also created this habitat assessment and native plant tool, which helps grower figure, growers figure out where to put um, habitat and what native plants support birds best. So that I was I was curious to hear about your plant bird and plant um, effort, and um, we published this chart. It's part of that tool where it um, rates different plants as their support for birds. Uh, some of this information is actually based on the um, CNPS website data, uh, like the flowering and fruiting times and the insects that are supported, the caterpillars are supported. Um, but this, all of this data is uh, looking at Cornell Ornithology's research uh, database that documents which birds are using which native plants. Although we don't go down to species um, with this just to genera, but you could see like um, the darker the, the blue here, the better a bird is supported. And I think this is my last slide. This is Dennis at Blue Heron. Installing boxes is another small connection to something bigger. I think he's talking about nature here. Like in Buddhist tradition, to do real work, it takes a big context in which to look at things. And then he says, put up boxes. So that is it. I'm going to stop sharing and um, yeah, see if there's any questions. Nice. So, Thank you so much. That was really illuminating. Yeah. I love the part, you know, we're a lot of us here on the line are secretly birders <laughs> <laughs> or not so secret, you know, people that are in the native plants, a lot of, a lot of people came in through the birding world and, um, and so it, uh, it gladdens our hearts to see these harm reductions for birds, because of course we know that the number one cause of bird decline is from agricultural practices because we all like to eat. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, there's uh, there's some good questions out there. Uh, if you've got a few minutes and you can. can sure. Oh yeah, okay, I'm looking at the chat. Um, uh, it's being very, thanks for that. Either bush tit or rent tit. Uh, it's a bush tit. <laughs> <laughs> I can give um, you an authoritative answer on that one. <laughs> Western bluebirds have greatly benefited from the box program. Yes. Uh, Medlock Ames wine is delicious. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Please find a replacement for Lissom. It is invading our wildlands. That is an interesting point. Um, I, I, I know that it can spread. I didn't know that. It, I've never seen it in wildlands. Um, yeah. Uh, it's quite we, a problem here in the Bay Area. Uh, um, we have, we are looking as hard at all the literature that we can get our hands on, um, the journal articles uh, for papers that are identifying native plants that are supporting beneficial insects and, and other kinds of arthropods like for uh, spiders and, and predaceous mites. But there's a lot of research is done on non-native plants, which is frustrating. And so, um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I hope that we can find a replacement for Lissom because that is troubling. There's almost always a native plant that has a very similar characteristics of a non-native plant. And that's one of the things we're often scratching our head. It's like, 
for example, you know, the, the well-known non-native landscape plants, and we're like, why are you using that? We've got one here that just has those same characteristics. It's much finer. <laughs> so it's just... Yeah, well, if anybody, if you or anybody can think of a plant um, that has those same characteristics, I'd love to know about it. Yeah, um, we, we should, yeah. Do, we'll, we we'll, we should do a little looking into state. that. Right. State CMPS will probably have some ideas because we've often done these yes. plant this okay. instead of that kind of thing. So we'll, yeah. have, we'll have to look. But um, yeah, cool. and uh, and Bob had a good question too about um, which is in the Q&A, which says, uh, what are some of the reasons why farmers don't want to plant hedgerows? Um. Yeah, why don't they plant? Because they want to make more money on their crops. They don't want to, they want to farm every square inch. But, you know, that's to, if you're going to do that, there's all kinds of potential issues. I mean, hedgerows, besides supporting um, beneficial insects, also help support pollinators. And if you have crops that need pollination, then you have to bring in bees and then the bees come in and they're Sometimes they're sick and or more often these days that be be um there's so many honeybee problems. Um, but yeah, and and these native plants, as you know, they're gonna hold uh soil in place, they're gonna um help filter pathogens, all these things that I talked about. But why I think the main reason is farmers are like, well, I could make money uh growing a crop. But the second reason is I think that they don't want to pay for the hedgerow and so it's really great that right now the state is have these programs or there's several there's there's the healthy soils program which is uh, funded by California Department of Food and Ag CDFA um, the state also funded the wildlife conservation board who who then funded uh, Point Blue Conservation Science with $26 million that they're giving out to growers to put in habitat. Um, CDFA also funded a pollinator um, habitat program that we are uh, collaborating with another group on helping growers with that. CDFA is also um, funding us to help growers create conservation plans. It's like a technology glitch. That the alien ship has returned and has gotten between us. I'm afraid uh, we've lost you, Joanne. You've frozen up there. Oh, but thank you all for, for coming tonight. Um, this has been a really informative presentation, and um, uh, Joanne did provide her contact information. If you have uh, further questions, um, hopefully uh, we can share share those with her, or you could contact her directly. Um, but um, hope to see you next month at our program about grasslands. Um, it'll be really fascinating as well. Yeah, and I see Joanne is trying to log back on here, but uh, could be that we've we've lost her. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, thanks again for being here, and it's so nice to see everyone. Oh, here comes Joanne. <laughs> I'm go. sorry. Yeah, I'm my sorry. Internet. That's okay. No, no problem. No problem. Uh, you got through the your presentation without. <laughs> with only the one the one glitch you know one thing I, i'm curious about though um and this is because um another uh, another birding event one time there's a uh down in Año nuevo which i'm sure you know that part it's uh uh just nor north of santa cruz at the santa cruz san mateo sure. so there they uh, lease some land to an organic farmer. White, 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 uh, something, White Springs, I think is what they call it. 
anyway, uh, at one time, you know, as farmers had a lot of coal, sometimes they'll have a lot of coals, you know, the, the stuff that doesn't make it or it's just gotten past or whatever. In and this one year, it was Brussels sprouts. This farmer had all of these Brussels sprouts and they piled them into this field, probably a, about six or eight inches deep. Yep, to compost. Maybe like it was pretty big. It was like a hundred yards by a hundred foot, you know, by a hundred foot. And uh, and these all started rotting in this area. I guess their idea was they just fertilize, you know, use it as a fertilizer. And the array of birds and wildlife that got into that was just fantastic. And all of these, like these rare birds were showing up and you could go down there and there'd be like, hundreds of warblers they all eating people. the insects right. out of these rotting Brussels sprouts. Wow. She didn't want to step in them. They were just <laughs> no. super nasty. Yeah. You know, but anyway, I was just wondering if there's any, any, uh, been any thought on the waste management side to uh, take some of their stuff and benefit wildlife in that way. Since we know they have to get rid of it sometimes. Yeah. Well, the thing about food and wildlife is the um it's hard it, you're gonna bring you might bring wild pigs in. You might oh, bring yeah. and uh and wild pigs carry more foodborne pathogens than any and they're non native, so we don't like right. them anyways. Um yeah. uh uh, than any of our our um, native wildlife. Although sometimes deer have been known to carry some pathogens if they're exposed to some, you know, some livestock that have pathogens. And um, so it's kind of tricky bringing wildlife in to, you know, and in, in, in a lot, a lot of wildlife into your farm. Um, Right. Well, one thing uh, I heard that you may, you know, when the question was, why don't they want hedgerows? I remember from about 10 or 15 years ago, th there was an E. coli breakout outbreak. And one of the, you know, whether it was uh, scientific, science based or not, at that time, a lot of the uh, farmers thought that E. coli was coming from animals that were uh, at the edges of the fields. It ended up, it was probably, you know, possibly just from some, you know, human waste treatment issue. But um, anyway, and at that time that they went out and they just took out all of this, you know, um, hedgerow type habitat. And, uh, and, you know, and because they were, didn't want to be sued for E. coli, of course, so. Um, but it, I think it was spinach, maybe, or some lettuce where it happened. Mm -hmm. so that yeah. that I I mean, it is a real health concern. So I'm sure it has to be done well. But it, but what's interesting is since then there's been some good research or good research done by UC Davis where they looked at the farms that have taken out all their habitat and and ask the question, are they safer? And in, they're not safer. And in fact, they're a little less safe because there are, you know, things that come along with having uh, having habitat. Like for instance, the, if you have bare ground ditches, there's a new study. Well, there's a few studies, but there's this new study where um, if you have bare ground ditches, you're gonna have deer mice and deer mice a lot of deer mice and a, an uh, animal of the same species share pathogens a lot easier because they're hanging out together as opposed if you have a vegetated ditch you know where it's it's filtering the water and it, it it'll have um, rodents but it won't have a lot of one kind of rodent it'll have a diverse um, species mix and They'll, the numbers of rodents will be way, way, way less. And so there's there's less of them and they're not sharing pathogens And as an example. But habitat too, 
filters, pathogens. And if you don't have any habitat, then, you know, it it's just going to get spread easier. And the thing that's really one of the biggest problems with food safety, there's a couple, you brought up one, which was, um, or you sort of brought it up um, gently, was, um, is it the processing plant? And when you harvest huge vats of salad mix, you can imagine it has all these cut surfaces and then it goes into vats of water that are chlorinated or some kind of chemical and cooled. And and uh, if there's some pathogen in there, it can get mixed up. And, you know, probably most of the time it's not going to make people sick, but it's just a riskier product. There's There's no way around it. And the other thing is that if you farm next to a big can find animal feeding lot where like cattle carry pathogen, E. coli pathogens more than anybody, any of our domestic livestock. And um, some of these big CAFO type operations, like half of the of the uh, animals will have E. coli, the kind of E. coli that kills us. And so if you're farming next to that, maybe there's water running off into the stream that you're using that water, or there's birds like um, that are eating the spent grain and then coming over and they will carry the cat pathogen. So it's kind of like, it's, it's our mess that then we, you know, wildlife has to deal with and, and, or, you know, the way that we, process our food when it's much safer to just go buy a head of lettuce um, and uh, make the salad yourself because there's not all those cut surfaces. You cut the surfaces and um, it's not going in a big vat of water. And yeah. So. Cool. Something, something more to think about. Right. Well, thank you so much, Joanne. We really appreciate you being here and and hope you can catch the end of it, that concert you were talking <laughs> about down there in Watsonville. And thanks to you yeah. and your husband for yeah. that, uh, the, the book, uh, The Supporting Beneficial Birds. Right. We'll, we'll be checking that out. Yeah. I teach a class on bird conservation, so I'm going to check that out before I teach the next one. <laughs> Oh, great, great. Yeah, I know. And I'd love to talk to you guys offline about Alyssa and see if we can figure something out. So yeah. thank you again. It, this was really nice to meet you and to be part of your community and um, CNPS rocks. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Yeah, let's get together sometime. Okay. We'll stay in touch. Yes. All right, everybody. Bye. Good night.